Cheers. Cheers. That's right, that's both. <laughs> short notice. Short notice. Yeah, right, we should have. Twenty-four hours. Mm. No, mate. Mega. Tw- Twenty-one honest. to drive here. It's uh, it's one of those. Sometimes I, it happens. Sometimes with the, the schedule of the podcast. You have a fastball, and then actually something quite positive. Not a fastball. Someone like drops up his bones, and you get something positive yeah. come out of it. Like, yeah, we'll dead, how, dead man shoes, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how, we'll see how the day goes. There. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers for bringing the books in, mate. I I appreciate it. The um. Your one, yep. Brothers and arms that you signed. I'll do a giveaway for that. Myself. Sounds good, mate. Yeah, and uh, man, you got fucking books coming out of your ears. Yeah, well, it's a weird one because we're in a weird situation today because I know a bit about you because I wrote a book that features you. Yeah, I'm um, going to talk to you about that as well. Which is kind of a it's, that's a weird little thing, really, because when we first met, I was like, oh, I know you. Well, when I- uh, <laughs> so the book you're on about for yep. people listening and watching is No Way Out by Adam Jarrett. Um, Adam was uh, the company commander in company commander of a company called Easy Company, which is a group of power agent and Royal Irish, and they were we. He's part of it as well. This is, um, it was the se- known as it became known as the Siege of Musakala, where uh, well, it's, I suppose the highlight of the story, if you like, is that the Taliban got us out. Yeah. <laughs> but um, when I see you put a post on. I wasn't sure who you were, right? Because I don't really. Yeah, I Mickey. use social media, right? But <laughs> yeah. I don't go. I don't fucking. You know, I, I'm not mental on it. I wasn't. I was thinking, well, no. So, I seen your name flitting about. I seen your podcast flitting about, and then I saw you put a post up saying, uh, um, "You were something like you were happy that No Way Out, the book No Way Out, was doing so well, and blah blah blah." And you and it said something like you'd helped to write it, and I was like, "What?" Who is this bluffer? Yeah. Who is this yeah. bluffer? No bluff. way. I rang, I rang Adam up. I, I rang really? Adam up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was one of the few times he answered his phone. He, he yeah, answered his phone. Nightmare. I said, mate, he's some, nightmare. He's <laughs> love him, but he's a nightmare. I said, I said Adam, there's some dude saying he'll write your book. I'm like, his name's such and such. Is he a, is he a Walt? <laughs> and, yeah. and then Adam told me all about it. How, so, mate, how'd writing? Right. How did you get into that? Uh, it was a young lad. <laughs> I was a young lad and I watched Jurassic Park and I started writing a sequel to it when I was a kid fuck off no I did Jane I've got it at home still with pictures and then when Jurassic Park 2 came out in the theatres it was just like what I'd written so got mugged off there hang but, on mate, hang on hang on I just want to clarify something here. you wrote the sequel you can't make no idea you wrote the sequel to Jurassic I wrote, Park I wrote something that was very similar to it right, so I can only I mean, assume that it was stolen from me <laughs> as a child and me how old were you? Fucking hell, I don't know, 37. Who did Jurassic Park? It's, well, it's Stay written by Michael book. Crichton, wasn't it? Written by Michael Crichton, me, rest in peace. And then... Um, the first book, the book was. The second it? one, yeah, the second one was too. He wrote the second one, he wrote Lost World. And then I, then the rest of them were just... Did he write the book after you wrote yours? That is the question, isn't it? That, oh. that, mate, all, uh, once I've got the money to take on the estate of Michael Crichton, <laughs> there's going to be some uproar. But now, mate, like, so on the, I, I mean, that is a gen story. When I'm going to dig out the gun, I'm going to go in the garage one day and dig that fucking story out of there. But um, the stories, as in like the ones that are actually recognised as being by me and not stolen by Michael Crichton or Steven Spielberg, are. Um, <laughs> um, I started doing them. Uh, first one got published in 2000. Uh, 16 started writing like right at the end of 2014 um started writing 2014 i was doing the um ship security when did you get out uh 2011 okay so i was uh, i got out then as well yeah yeah well i was i was a dirty ta dirty staff and um i did the ftrs and then that that finished i think i think that finished two that, that finished 2011 and then i hung around in the ta for a bit after that but i just couldn't get into it after afghan and telic so um yeah i started working on the ships and um, got time on there to finally start writing, which is something I'd wanted to do for ages. Like I kept journals, pretty detailed journals when I was in Afghan. Roughly detailed one when I was in Iraq. And um, started putting them together, started just really, you know, all those hours when I wasn't wanking on stag, I, I was thinking about stories and I started <laughs> started putting them, putting them together. Um, you know, there's only so much of, uh, only so much of like, playing the devil's fruit you can do when you're in Sanger in there. So, um and then, yeah, put a, put a couple out in 2016, put one out in 2017, then last year, I think, three out, and then this year, I'll oh, hopefully get another three out this year. Um, so it's been busy, 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 busy okay. since then. Fucking hell, mate, smashing it. When, right, military. Yeah. When, so when did you join up, and what did you join up as? 2000, while well, I was in sixth form. Were you in the same time? I joined up 2000, mate. Well, yeah, it was How both. old are you? Well, I'm 35 now. Oh, you're younger than me, yeah, okay. Younger than 
Right, two, two, hang on, yeah. Let me get this through. Yeah, 2000. You were 16 now when you were that? 17. Just right, week, yeah. week I turned 17. Yeah. So I, the idea was I wanted to be an officer because I thought I was going to go do A-levels, uni. Um, so I went to the um, went to the local barracks to where the regimental secretary was because they're the ones that kind of guide you on the officer path. And he was, and I, cause I was like, oh, well, I guess I'll go to OTC when I'm in university. And he's like, oh, fuck that. You won't learn anything. He said, come with me. So he kind of like walked me over to the TA barracks and there was a guy, he was the PSAO, he was the, he's like the full time, um, he's like the full time, you know, admin guy. Staff guy. Yeah, he was the ex RSM of the 1st Battalion, Robot Fusiliers. And, okay. you know, good experienced bloke. And, he, you know, he, he was basically like, look, if you want to learn more about the actual job and then know what your blokes are going to be going for, he said, you join, you know, he said, do, do a few years, you know, in a, in a rifle company in the TA first, and you'll get to learn a lot more about it than you will do if you just do a drinking club in, you know, in the OTC. So I did that. And then, um, you know, and that was kind of, that, that worked well, you know, they give me the platoon si- uh, signal a position so that I could mir- mirror the t- platoon commander and, you That's know, good. learn that way. Yeah. Cause it was back in the days of the old fucking three, five, two giant things. And, you know, it was kind of, um, it was a good learning experience. And then for my first kind of annual camp when I went away with the TA was we were in Holland. Um, it was the week, uh, sorry, week before I turned um, 18. And we're in a, in a chip shop in Holland watching the TV. And we're like, oh, what's going on on here? And it's fucking planes flying into a building. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh. And then obviously things started to change from there. And then I was went to university, still in the TA. Some of my mates started to point <coughs> to Iraq on, you know, with the early telex. So my friends are up in Alamara on Telic 4, you know, pretty tasty, mm. Brian Wood kind of territory. And um, I started to think to myself, like, do I, do I want to do this officer thing? Or do I want to, you know, cause I kind of like what well, the lads are coming home and spinning some fucking dits about what they're doing on tour. I'm thinking, this is, that sounds a lot more fun to what, you know, because I, when I was looking at it at first, I know it's hard for people to get their heads around now if they're younger. But it was like, I was thinking, this is just going to be probably my job. And the best thing I can ever hope for is a batter's. Or something, you know, like a big, you know, live fire exercise. And all of a sudden, and you know what it's like, mate, as well. It's like, when this is happening, when the evasion's happening, you're thinking, oh, there's going to be a one month window here. And if I miss it, then it's done. I mean, joke's on us. 18 years later, it's still going on, mm. you know. But at the time, or, you know, since, since um, you know, first went into Afghanistan. But at the time, what I was thinking was, God, if I don't get out there now, it's going to be, be over. So I kind of floated the idea past my parents of, oh, can I drop out of uni to go to Iraq? And obviously that was like not well received. <laughs> it was kind of like, oh, yeah, you can do if you'd like to be cast out the family and never spoken to again. So I was like, all right, stay in uni. So I graduated uni. Um, graduated uni, used the TA as a backdoor. What did you graduate? Uh, history and politics. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so I used that as a backdoor. And um, I was like, oh, right, I'd like to go to, uh, so on Telic 9, a so it's like 9, 2006 in Iraq. Iraq was going absolutely mental at this point. So this is when you were in Af- Afghan. Iraq was fucking mental at that time. So I was like, oh, I'd like to go to the Kingos or the Staffords who are going to be the two armor battle groups. And they said, yeah, no problem. Did all my paperwork, get to the Reserve Mountain Center. They're going, oh, you're going on a force protection company, which is basically like what the RAF Reg do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I heard like your last episode, there was a RAF Reg slur. So I thought, let's keep it tradition. Really, I can't let's, do it. I have to be let's impartial. Keep, let's keep the tradition going. So here. we can slag him off at the end. Of it, I have to go, we love you really, RAF Reg. We love you really, Royal Marines. If you don't, the thing is what I've noticed about the RAF Reg <laughs> If you don't, I've actually started laying off them now because there's, I get so many people fucking crying about it. They like they they take it so personally. I almost feel like I've been bullying like a a, a fucking child. This is like, uh, this is banter though. It's it it banter. banter. It's like you're part of the club if you get banter. Mate, mate, Power Edge get slagged. I can't go. I can't speak to anyone in my circle of friends, colleagues, who is non-Power Edge without getting slagged. It's just like, you're just a target. Yeah. Well, yeah, for me, I mean, I'm a hat to you. <laughs> yeah. And to you, you know, you're just a fucking idiot who jumps out of a fucking plane. <laughs> like, um, you know, but that's how it is. It's the banter. But yeah, our regiment. Anyway, getting back on track. So, they do get hammered, though. I can't blame them for being sensitive, but they get fucking hammered. Well, they fucking deserve it. They should pick a real they're fucking job. <laughs> Go on. But yeah, so I was like sick to my stomach when I got this job. I was like, this is not what I fucking want to be, you know, want to be doing whatsoever. Um, and it actually turned out, looking with it with hindsight, it wasn't the worst thing that happened in the world. One, because I met some good lads. 
you know so there's a positive but the other thing is i did get to do some pretty gooch jobs like did um you know we had like a four-man team that worked with ato was their force protection oh, yeah. stuff and that was like looking back on it now that was really like lucky position to be in because you know you get to got to learn really because rather than just being on a fucking out accordion got to know what was going on in the middle of it explain and what ato is for people so that- ato is basically the bomb disposal guys with giant balls male and female <laughs> who yeah. um just yeah absolute mm. i fucking can't get my head around what they do but um but they were great and i loved that that job was great because we were on constant immediate notice to move basically um and we you know used to get crashed out and you know when you get crashed out and there's a fucking adrenaline rush and you're belt blowing through the gates and you're saying see you later all right regiment stack on <laughs> <laughs> and um you know that, that was really cool that was a great job the shiba no, this was a, a cob, so the uh, air, air base basically. Mm-hmm. Your shiba was closed by the by this point, or it was just finished and closing oh. up. Yeah, um, there was basically so the two tours I did, Telic Nine and Telic Ten, were the tours where everything was closing down. We're pulling out of everything, and by the time I left, everything was just down to um, the air base. But yeah, so Telic Nine, um, you know, I got to do some cool stuff like that. But it was really frustrating at the same time because sometimes I'd be stagging on in Sanger at the air base, and you can hear. Because you know gunfire travels, especially in the fucking desert, and you can see the tracer, and on the radio you can just hear this huge contact going off, and you can see the RPGs going, and the tracer bouncing, and the warriors driving around going like doo, 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 with a thirty mil, and I'm sat in the sand, like, ah! and I I know that's like most people, like any military people, you, you know, any military people who aren't are going to be like, oh yeah, I totally understand, you'd want to get stuck in there. I know, like, to any of civvies listening, you're probably thinking, like, you fucking mental. Like, why would you want to do that? Because that's what you want to be doing. So that was actually ridiculously frustrating. Because sometimes, mate, be stagging on the Sanger, and then the guys who have just been in this huge fucking contact, they come driving through, and you're seeing the lads with, with like, fags hanging out of their mouth, looking fucking nails, and you're just like, mother. And they're looking at me like, you fucking rem. I'm like, I want to be out there with you. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be amongst it. So I did what any reasonable person would do when you see a battle group getting smashed and say, I've got to stay on for a second tour, <laughs> uh, do back-to-back tours and go in that battle group, please. So the Royal Welsh, 2nd Battalion Royal Welsh were replacing the Kingos, uh, or two langs. Um, so I stayed on with them. Um, they assumed that I'd been with the Kings, or two langs. They assumed that I'd been with them. So we thought, oh, we've got an experienced lad here. Let's chuck him in, dismount commander in the lead vehicle. <laughs> I've never even been in a wire, didn't know how to open the door. <laughs> <laughs> but blokes being blokes, instead of going like, oh no, I've hardly I've hardly done any of the offer, I was just like, Yeah, no dramas. Sound. <laughs> yeah. And then just <laughs> bumble my way around for the next six months looking for IEDs and stuff. But yeah, it was, it was an interesting time, man. Iraq was pretty crazy. Went through a lot of you know, first part of the tour was like um pretty kinetic. And then the second part was basically kind of leaving Basra with our tails between our legs and this is something I think we've got in common but not many people know about this so you know obviously people now know the story about what happened with you guys leaving I don't think they really know the story about us leaving Basra go on then so basically what happened was the British government went to the Jaysh al-Mahdi the Mahdi army who were the biggest Shia militia in Iraq the ones we were doing most of the fighting against and they just made the deal of basically like, look, you leave us alone, we'll leave us, uh, you, you, you alone, we'll pull out the city. Didn't tell the Iraqi government about it, and then we just did one and left the sea. So when, when, when nah. we, yeah, yeah, the, you heard it here first, HR <laughs> podcast. <laughs> the British government decided to pull out of yeah. Uh, of um, there's Basra, a great book, tell great book called uh, "Losing Small Wars" by a guy called Frank Ledridge. I've heard of this. It's fantastic this. Yeah, book, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. If you have low blood pressure and you'd like to raise it a bit, read Frank Ledridge's book because your blood pressure will go through the fucking roof. For what frustration? Just frustration, mate. When you look at the facts, he was an intelligence officer, right? With right. is he Br- British intelligence officer? Yeah. So it's basically it's losing small wars, British military defeat in Iraq and Afghanistan. And when you look at where you were when you were there and where I was when I was there and you look at what they had available to them so there's the, there's facts in there mate it'll blow your mind that they like at the time of these invasions there was basically in the British army at the time something like 800 officers of the rank of colonel and above yeah it, it blows your mind mate but like go to the book for the statistics because I read this a couple of years ago what's but the main premise of it then the what? premise is basically how we went into these wars totally unprepared without any real plan and the British Army attitude of, oh, we'll crack on, was kind of like what led to our downfall because that was the 
you know, you let's say you're a general, you come to the brigadier and go, can you get this done? And the brigadier goes, oh yeah, we'll get it done. And then he passes it down and no one's, no one ever goes, look, this is fucking stupid. We can't control all the Helmand province with one fucking battle group. We can't do it. It's fucking retarded. Same in Basra. You know, I mean, the look at, you look at the number of troops we had. Basra one battle group. Um, by by the time that we left, we had the manoeuvre battle group and we had rifles. So there was basically realistically. But the thing is, mate, as well, when Fuck people, me. but when people are talking about battle groups, then we were so because it was pre recession, right? So lads were leaving. You couldn't get lads to stay on because a lot of the lads that we were with in Iraq were on their third tour in three. Um, sorry, third tour in three and a half years. Um, so we had in our war, with first warrior, we'd have four blokes in. Some of the warriors, we'd be lucky if we had two blokes in them. Like it's a four man crew, right? Well, it's a three man team. So, sorry, a three man crew. So, you've got gunner, commander, and driver. And then, realistically, you should have at least four guys in the back of each warrior. We had two in some of them, some of them are fucking empty. Um, like a platoon. I look at my platoon photo from, um, from Iraq, it's like 20 blokes. You know, so like the battalions weren't that, you know, they weren't, they weren't that many people there, mate. Like, we were, you know, really fucking, it was overstretched. The same, same, exactly what was going on with you. And you look at it now and you're like, why were we doing this in Afghanistan or Iraq when we didn't have the numbers for 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 real either? Why do you think? Why do you think it started then? Well, why I do you think th- we went in unprepared? Why do you think we went unprepared? Um, because overconfidence, I think one. It's the carryover of Iran having had the biggest empire of, in history. That a lot of that carries over. We won two world wars, not on our own, but we are. You know, we did come out two world wars as victorious. Um, and the other th- the other problem as well, mate, is that. You so and this again. This is something Frank Ledridge explains really well. Every time a new brigade comes into theatre, that brigadier is trying to put his stamp on that that campaign. So have you noticed how things always change every six months? Not just the troops, because the idea is. I think the idea of rotating the troops every six months is a solid one. But I actually don't. I would disagree that it should be all new troops coming in at once. I think that's fucking stupid. It should be a steady rotation of battle groups. Um, but so you've always got someone in the theatre who's more experienced in other places. So you could put a company somewhere, you know, you, know, you, you get what I mean. Mm-hmm. The problem is when you bring in a new commander, and let's be honest, a lot of these, once you get above the rank of colonel, we're talking politics, a lot of this stuff. They come in and they're like, right, well, this is how we're going to do things now. So there's no con- continuity. It's always like, oh, well, the last six months we've been taking a back seat and we've been concentrating more on Simic. The next six months we're going to go super dynamic and we're going to be, you know, we're going to do fucking compound clearances. Then the next six months someone's going to come in and do a different approach. There's no consistency. Six months, mate, fucking nothing. I can barely make a book in six months. How are you supposed to restructure a country in six months before you change tactics? Well, I agree with you. It's yeah. a, I fucking, I, I've said it a few times. You want to, you know, while Iraq and Afghan, you, uh, you um, if you really intend on doing, on, on changing those places for the better in, what, in whatever way you think they should be changed, like you're saying now, and you're not even talking decades, mate. You're talking fucking centuries, potentially centuries. Yeah. Yeah. Afghan, it, that's a long it takes to right, change l- l- Let's look at our Second World War opponents, right? Germany, we are still have, well, we, but the, the Americans still have troops in Germany. We've just recently closed our places in Germany. That war finished, what, 60, 80 years ago? Um, Japan, America still has huge garrisons in Japan. People are okay and acknowledge this. We still, America still has troops in Korea. Like, and when I'm not saying troops is in 300 training team, I'm talking divisions of troops. Thousands and thousands and thousands of troops. They, Americans probably have more troops in Korea than we have in the fucking British Army or something close. Um, you know, you can't... The, and the thing is, oh, I was in Afghan in 2009, actually in the same neck of the woods that you were. I was up in um, just south of Muscala. Okay. Um, Whereabouts were you? A uh, village called Yatamshai. So it's just, yeah, it's just... That was oh, that was firmly Taliban while you were there. <laughs> like, that, that, was, that was fought for and kind of recovered from the Taliban, I think, in, on and off. But I think f- that kind of held in mid-2009 and then we took over and did like a ground holding roller. Mm. Um, and then now, obviously, now it's back in Taliban control, as is everywhere else that was fought for. Um, you know, I think it, I can't remember if it was while we were out there, if we were we got we were back. But like, you know, we the idea that you basically say to the enemy, All right? By the way, we're pulling out in eighteen months' time. It's got to be one of the most ludicrous things I've ever heard in my fucking life. Like, it's absolutely mental. Like, you know, I think something that 
maybe in the West that especially politicians and don't understand and you know some voters too which is the knock-on effect of the politicians is that we think about time differently in this country and in America than people like Afghanistan do they think about they think about um, they're quite willing to fight a war the last 50 years if a war for us goes over five months people start to kick off you know and because they, they understand war and they've got long memory you know, they knew, they remember and talk about the wars where they beat Britain in the past, which a couple hundred years ago. Most people in the UK don't know about that. Most people in the UK don't really know about fucking Falklands, barely. If you're young, if you're a young kid now, you don't know about the Falklands, <coughs> guarantee you. No. We have a very short memory in this, in this country. Fucking Afghans don't. So, like, to them, the idea, like, they were probably literally laughing when they heard, um, you know, Obama say, um, oh, yeah, we, this is the date we're pulling our troops out. They were probably pissing themselves. And I'm not hating on Obama any more than any other politician because they all do it. But like that, that idea that you can set a time limit on on a, on a mission like that is like like dude like uh, building a business. They say it takes what three years for a business to get profitable. So we acknowledge that, but then we're going to put a little time limit of a few years onto reconstructing and because re- you know we're not talking a gloss of paint on these countries. We're talking you need to if this was a if this was a house, you're stripping it back to the frame and rebuilding everything. What do you think um what do you think so Iraq, Afghan, um both we'll talk about both those as, as the same kind of same same kind of affair from the perspective that Oh you may disagree. Um I think you know same fucking anything mate, like you're saying with politicians, right? The reasons that we went in that we were told we were going in to is not the real reasons why we were going in. You know, there was a, there was, a, there, was a, there was grander things afoot. So, with that in mind, do, would you agree with that or not? Oh yeah, I would, I would agree with that one hundred percent. Okay, so with that in mind, right? If we weren't going into, you know, um, make Afghan, make Iraq a better place, in, I'm generalising that statement. What what uh, what do you think the aim? What do you think the intent was? I think the intent is, um, and this is like from. One thing that I've always been interested in is the history of warfare, or history in general, but warfare especially. And then when you look at things, you see patterns, right? And we all like to think that as individuals, we're special. And we like to think that the time we're living in is special. And of course it is in some ways. But when you actually look at history as a whole, you'll see repeating patterns. And when it comes to war, the repeating patterns usually are war is for profit, war is for distraction. Um, And I just think that they they were the same reasons this time. Um, You know, I made a tweet... This week, because I was just thinking, like, you know, when when there was all those ma- the, those executions recently in um, Saudi Saudi Arabia. Now, yes, some of those people may have been terrorists, but that doesn't, you know. But I, it just made me think about, you know, we've still got, you know, uh, air quotes allies who will kill people for blasphemy laws. But then at the same time, we say that that's the reason that we're fighting ISIS because they kill people, you know, because they behead people that don't believe it. And I'm thinking. A lot of hypocrisy, I agree. It, 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 massive hypocrisy. Oh. So I'm thinking, okay, so um, so what that says to me is that means that it can't be ideological because if it was ideological, then we would be doing the same thing for everyone. So the ideological thing is just a mask when it suits. So what can be the real reasons? And you only have to look at, um, you know, there's um, there's there's a lot of people who have made a lot of money, you know, off off of wars, and it's also a great it is a great distraction because it's like. When it's the same way as if you want to blame immigrants for something, you know, does immigration cause some problems? Absolutely, it does. But it's very easy for you to say, "Oh, you, uh, you know, things are going bad in your work. Blame an immigrant." You know, well, immigration does, but mass immigration does. Yeah, but like this, this there is problems with everything, and like the same way that there's there is reasons to go to war. One hundred percent, there's legitimate reasons to go to war. I don't think anybody could have an issue with the fact that we fought the Second World War against the the Nazis. You know, you like. Um, same with dropping the nuclear bombs on in, on Japan. There are times when violence is the answer, um, and you know it's 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 a bit of pill to swallow when you realise that you've been a part in wars that really weren't what you got sold on. But all that being said, I'd be the first to stick my hand up and say, even knowing that, if you'd have told me that at the time, I probably would have still gone anyway because I wanted the experience. Yeah, I, I and yeah, no, yeah, I, I, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one that. Right, because a little point you made there. Um, because I I've always been of the the belief that you can't afford you can't afford as a soldier or 
paratrooper or guardsman or whatever, fusilier, whatever. You can't afford to um, question the the morals and ethics of why you're going to a place. You can absolutely can question what orders you're being given on a tactical level, like go and shoot, go and shoot that woman. Not that I've ever been given that order. Go and shoot that civilian woman. Did nothing wrong. Yeah. Well, I'm fucking question that. I ain't yeah. doing it, Sunny Jim. But on the grander level, when you start questioning, like like we're talking about now. Why were we there? Was it was it right to be there? Blah 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 blah. <clears throat> if I had done that back at the time, if I had allowed myself to do it back at the time, it comp- it compromises your ability on the ground one hundred percent because you bring your emotions into it. You're not thinking tactically, um, and uh, and you're not one hundred percent invested in the mission. Mm. And that's what happens. <clears throat> and but even in something like what you say now, even knowing what I know now, put you back in those shoes. I do it again. Oh, fuck you. If, yeah, one hundred percent. Well, mate, we've I've actually got. Um um, an extract in my journal where when we lost one of the lads, and that night we were at, we all were pissed off, and we could we could we could see that things weren't working, and we said that and like I've I've written what lads were saying that night, and we we knew at the time that what we were doing was doomed doomed to failure, but we still wanted to go out and scrap, like that didn't that didn't change, like, and I think that's something that I thought I've always like it's. They're not, you know, life isn't fucking simple because people say, oh, so you don't think we should have been there? Well, yeah, we still, like, the fact is, once we were there, there was an enemy that was worth fighting, in my opinion. You know, I would have liked to have seen through the mission for the, just because we were there on um, false pretenses doesn't mean that we couldn't have done good while we were there. And for a short time in some places, I think we did do good. Um, you know, 100%, there was a lot of people there who would have liked to have stayed. Mate, I get fucking messages on my social media from people in Iraq, civilians in Iraq and stuff, saying, please come back to Iraq. They want us back because they say, since we leave, it's just the militias are just, especially in Basra, like, because obviously, they, you know, the ones out in fucking rural Musakala are not, you know, they're not fucking on the ground. But um, the, um, you know, ones in Iraq, you know, they can have access to the internet and they say that it's just, you know, the these Shia militias running the place and they're fucking brutal and they want they want the days back when there was British soldiers on the ground Iraq is one of the most disgusting most corrupt places I've ever worked yeah. and uh, very similar in, now from, from an indiv- on an individual level to per- person to person when you meet you know the Iraqis and this is more uh, an Islamic cultural thing very very generous very kind very polite um, but then but then you get that in group in a group fucking just so this whole place so corrupt which it was different to Afghan that, in that regard I, I tell you something I struggle with not struggle with a question that's been flitting around my mind last six six to twelve months I thought not not addressed properly is um or an observation is that you know we're talking about there going in and 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 scrapping and you're saying about a, an enemy worthy of going and scrapping you now they fucking need smashing they're doing good things on the ground as in getting the Taliban of a village, blah blah blah. <clears throat> One of the issues I can see with that is is we the reference point we are using for improving the reference point we're using for improving an area, a village, a town, a country's um way of life is a Western reference point. So which isn't correct. <clears throat> um so we should use a, a reference point, an Afghan reference point. Okay, what is like what like before we went in, right, for example was the Kala, Sangin, fucking Goresh, wherever. Before we didn't know what was what was their pattern of life like, mm-hmm. okay? And and how, what impact did it have on them? Their pattern of life, basically the Taliban, I would say it was just like having coppers. You just had coppers knocking about, albeit slightly fucking strict coppers, right? Who who's uh, whose use of force was questionable. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> that's just counts. it's just it's just yeah, it's just the way their life is and they just crack on yeah you know i'm gonna go on i'm gonna go and do this today i'm gonna go and farm oh the taliban fucking tommy taliban came out the door i've got to go and give x amount of my crop to him or give him this money or i have got to go down on the road oh there's a there's a checkpoint the taliban were there and I, I had to pay the money normal pattern of life they don't see that as a bad thing because yeah. that's just normal life yeah well the thing is well, what i say to that is um you know you're talking about tommy taliban coming knocking on the door and asking for their share of the crop um, what happens to you if Her Majesty's government comes and knocks on your door and asks for your part of your wage and you don't give it to them? Mm. You go to prison. And you don't get your hands chopped off, but you get punished. Like, the idea... This is my point. Yeah, the this idea that point. we don't get punished in this system for not complying to the ruling thing is like, is theirs more is theirs more brutal? Yes, it is more brutal, but you get punished here by the, by, by the people that govern you just as much as they get punished by theirs. Like, um, you know... And, yeah, and uh, here's the other thing as well, mate. Did 
the, the, like, a country like Afghanistan has the potential to be incredibly dangerous and incredibly lawless. A lot of the people would rather just have the Taliban in charge because when they're in charge, there's security. Now, they might, like, occasionally, you know, you might hear that Bob got his head chopped off because, you know, they found out that, um, I don't know, they found out that he was, I was, I'm trying to think of an example that they he do was, kill people because they're, they're he, all right he, with the kid stuff and they're all right with the animal stuff. But all right, let's find, he, he had, they had, he had a couple of big, a uh, couple of big jokes magazines under his pillow, right? <laughs> Uh, okay, so he's in trouble for that. But what they're not going to have, probably when the Taliban are in charge, they're probably not going to have people coming into their compounds in the middle of the night and stuff. And that, for that part of the world, that is a base level that that, that is what they want. They consider that a good life. Um, we're very egotistical as a culture in the West of assuming that everybody wants what we want. Some people don't want what, what, like, what, what, what we, we want. Do you not think it's, it's interesting that seeing more and more now, I know you're into personal development and stuff as well, you know, you look at these, look, look at the, look at books, audio books, podcasts, whatever. The amount of people who are successful people in the West now who are going away to retreats in the Amazon to, to get away from what we have in the West. Because I'm sure you found the same, mate. I said, the, you know, the reason that, like, Afghanistan was some of the best days of my life was not necessarily just because of the scrapping, which obviously was full of adrenaline filled house, but it was the nights when you're sitting around with the boys, you got a little fire going, you're just chatting, you got no phones, no distractions. Yes. It's, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's Stars, human, it's human nature, mate. Yeah. It's this life, isn't yeah. it? It's and, like, and that's what yeah. they have in Afghanistan, mate. Like that, that's what they have now. You know, some oh god, must, my life up without Facebook must be terrible. No, it's fucking liberating. Put your phone on airplane mode for a day. Do you know what they don't? You know. Obviously, they just come back from Mozambique with that disaster mm. out there. Iraq, Afghan. Do you know what those countries don't have? So they don't have all the technology we have. They don't have the Western way of life, right? They just they are they are as connected to each other and nature as you can be in this day and age right do you know what they don't have suicide mm. they fucking don't have it people don't kill themselves mate they don't kill themselves like that Mozambique well, people are on their ass whole villages wiped out right as in nothing nothing they got nowhere to live all the crops are gone no, they, they can't even regrow they're fucked so six months time for, hmm, less than that three four months time they're going to be hitting a famine there's going to be tens of hundreds potentially hundreds of thousand people dead right. you know what I'm get yeah. Fucking suicide because you just crack on. Well, the thing just is, I, I think the thing is the suicide. There's always you got to look at like so. Afghanistan has a very fa- high female suicide rate because obviously the position they're in is just basically treated as property. Civvies. It's terrible. Oh yes, yeah, the Afghan civvies. Yeah, yeah, really? Yeah, the the female one is very high. They drink stuff like bleach and stuff to kill themselves. It's pretty horrific okay. because they are so badly treated. Like they they are just raped and beaten. Yeah, like yeah. their lives are horrible. The men, no, the yeah. men's not so much. Um. But yeah, I mean, like you've, you know, the the I think it's suicide now is the leading cause of death among young men, isn't it? You know, it's it's and it's it's climbing and it's it's climbing in women too, and there's a reason behind that. Well, are you aware that the, the in America the studies going on with with females committing suicide in America? Yeah, gone through gone gone through the roof, um, and it's oh, fuck me, I can't. The, the, it's really worrying. It's and they've there's been a bunch of studies on it. And it's teenage girls. So it's self harming and suicide. The rate is climbing. It's like something like quadrupled over the last eight, nine years. Mm. When they look at it all back, it all starts around about the, the increase starts in around about 2009, 2010. Mm. Um, all of a sudden they're doing Facebook came about in 2007. Yeah. Twitter was like 2005. But basically, like it's social. It's almost entirely down to social media. Well, it's because there's no escape, and then it's like back in back in the day. It's like you go into school, you get bullied, you then go home. So you're in school for your eight hours, you get bullied, but then you get a break. There's no fucking break now. No, and from, and from the right. but from the girls. You might ask, well, why is it girls and not boys? And 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 uh, do you listen to the Joe Rogan podcast? Yeah, well, so sometimes it depends who's gone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. um so, the girls, because, so how does, how does, how do I, how, if I wanted to hurt you, you know, I think you're a prick, I want to hurt you, how am I going to do it? It's going to be physical. Yeah, it's going to be fucking physical. It's, it's either going to be physically hurting you or something you own, like your car, mm. or something like that, right? I'm going to smash something up, or smash you up. I'll have, I'll have a, I'll have a bash, mind. <laughs> <laughs> girls don't do that. Females don't do that. Females hurt emotionally. They, okay, they, right, they, they, they do it. <laughs> oh, deep. Oh. Yeah, females hurt people through emotion because they haven't got the physical oh they know what to say yeah so fucking with the advent of social media all it does and look women I'm not saying women are worse than men this is the way fucking shit happens right so social media 
gives them more tools to be so if they don't like someone yeah. they go they go on they'll unfriend them or they'll say some shit online about their or they'll pm in and what's yeah. that all that and this is what they put in this well, this thing let me ask you mate, uh, let me ask you as a grown man be honest on the answer has there been a point where you've seen someone unfollow you and it's made you go oh fucking hell for, for your mates even as a grown man have you had one of those moments where you've had you've had something that's maybe just like touched on an insecurity? Because I I I've definitely had it where I I thought like you know oh um oh I see oh I've seen oh he's invited these people to something I didn't get him but whoa was this was it oh the oh, invite thing going? yeah well they're just I'm just I, saying something I'm not saying it bothers you massively yeah. but the fact is as someone even as a grown man there can be things where maybe. You know, you might like, like a little con- like I heard one in podcast. You mentioned, you know, someone says that you're a thicker or something like that. Oh, like, no. you know, sometimes you brush it off. Sometimes, if you, let's say you were having a day where, you know, you felt fucking hell, my I really can't get my shit together this week. My work's not fucking great. Am I doing the right thing with my life? Fucking misses is you know having a problem with misses, and you know, like it could be some you know you you open yourself up to that potential negativity. You know, put yourself in the mind of. I like, do. I remember in school, it was fucking like you talk about banter in the military. There's a lot of banter, right? But it's good natured most of it. Fucking high school, mate. <laughs> like, I am amazed there wasn't a fifty percent casualty rate from suicide in school. Looking back on it now, it's <laughs> stuff people used to say <laughs> yeah, to each so, other, mate. Fuck, mate. I fucking I I, I didn't speak. I know I was a right. I was like brightest ginger you ever seen. Is that why? Is that why you went? Is that why you were in Paris? I'll fucking show you. We're gonna be a paratrooper. I, 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 fucking basically what it was, <laughs> but not for them. For me, like I yeah. was just a weed, mate. Yeah. A weed, like I had no self confidence, no self esteem. I fuck it. I was. I, I didn't like. I couldn't. I couldn't. I struggled to look people in the eye. Mm-hmm. I struggled to have a conversation with anyone. I spoke really quietly, um, and then uh, yeah, fucking. And then they got to the point. And I thought I need to fucking prove something here. Plus, I now, sort of yeah. ran out of options. It's like okay, right. I fucking. I, I, <laughs> now we get into it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was getting booted out of college. All right. Um, I basically, I basically left before I got booted. I, I did a website called. Um, oh, I'm gone. <laughs> I spent so I went to college with computing, right? And right. in my A level computing class, I spent the time writing a, a website. Oh, and I published it as well. It's Neath College. Neath College sucks. Dot co. All right, it's not as bad did as I was expecting. There was no, 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 no. Sorry, I mean, no, you've been no. a para, mate. I was fucking no, just worried no. about what was going to come <laughs> up there. <laughs> Resies no. and fucking no, all no, sorts no, involved. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it was, no, it was all right, but fucking, I got booted out with that. So, yeah. and I, wanted, I think at the time, I wanted to join up as, a, as an officer to the RAF. That's what I recall vaguely. And then there's like twenty spent twenty four hours at a para. Did a weekend, like so look at life, and then the rest is history. But um. Yeah, so fucking school, mate. Well, okay, I wanted to jump because I know you talked about this before, so we don't, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But you know, when you talk about the snowflake campaign, how would that, like the the army recruiting thing with the snowflakes, how would that have connected? Would do you reckon that would have connected to you when you were that age? Uh, I can't answer that. I, I I don't know because it was the, the I don't know. Um. Because it is hard for us to, because we're not sixteen year olds now. Do you know what I mean? Like, because there definitely is a difference in it's hard, someone it's that's different grown up with social media and stuff. It's like, yeah, mo- a lot of stuff is similar, but they, you know, we also have to acknowledge that change. Because I was thinking about it, because I was like, oh, I wouldn't have worked for me, but then I thought, well, yeah, but I don't know what I'd be like now if it'd been social media and stuff. That's I, I, mean, I think yeah. I reckon if you're an infantry soldier, I, well, I have this hypothesis, right? That infantry, which hypothesis, big word for infantry soldier to you. So, can we, can mate, we I, I, I was, <laughs> I was <laughs> practicing that one in the car. Um, that I reckon there's a certain amount of people in a country that are born with something in their DNA that makes them want to fight. Be that in the octagon, be that in a boxing ring, be that on a battlefield. Um, and I, I think that your infantry blokes that end up in the infantry, mo- not all blokes, because you know some just end up in the infantry because they're not allowed to do anything else. But a lot of blokes, I reckon, end up there because there's something in them that just makes them want to fight. Now, that maybe that's partly a nurture thing as well. But I, I just think that... I Because I just look back at history, there's always been a certain amount of people who are willing to fucking scrap. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm not sure of that. It, well, that's not me. That's not me at all. No. Um, I fucking enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. But it's because... Mm-hmm. Is because it's, I found someone I was really good at. So it wasn't that you wanted to fight then, it was what you wanted to prove No, the it was it's basically stuff. I wanted to prove myself to myself. It's no. like, okay, you're a fucking weed, you know. Uh, <laughs> obviously, weed. I didn't think of it like that. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, you got to... And there's a lot of options. I, and you wanted to join the military. Um, and then it was like, powers, okay, powers, fitness. Yeah, I can be fit. And then I was like, oh my God, like d- day one, week one in power depot. Like, oh, I made the wrong decision. <laughs> <laughs> I got, <laughs> somehow I got all the way through. And then... Um, and then got to battalion, and then you know, I, and then I just, I was just very good. I was just very good at the job. Mm-hmm. 
and then you know it's like when you when you find something you're good at you fucking enjoy doing it mm. but I was not a scrapper before that right <laughs> I well, obviously I know you got I, I know you'd have to say para reg if you if I said what would you do again but if you couldn't do para reg what would you do if you if you did do the military again um pilot be a pilot yeah what in what uh I don't know. I don't know. I um, because I think, mate, there's talk talk about a golden age. If you were a ground attack pilot, Afghanistan has got to be the golden age of. Because it's like, thing is, if you ground attack pilot in the Falklands or the Second World War or Korea, you had a high chance of getting shot down. Or or the Gulf War, first Gulf War. If you've been a pilot, (laughs) ground attack pilot over Afghan, you fucking basically just get to turn up murk the hell out of people yeah. and then go home and then smash someone at Kandahar or wherever you're based. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. A, like, that's a blessed job, man. Yeah, it's a boxy job, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it just, yeah. I mean, like, obviously, you know, having done that book, I know how much close air support you've seen. Yeah. I, actually, you know what? I'll, t- I'll take A-10 pilot. Oh, what, mate? Fuck me. I, oh, I'll take A-10. Mate, A-10 pilot. Mate. Yeah. They are, I, mate, we, we, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's in the book. I've read three quarters of it. I don't know if it's in there. You know how it ends. Um, I know how it ends, yeah. But there's a bit in Musakala. There's a, there a moment in Musakala, and the fuckers were quite close, and the A-10 came in, and like the danger close firing for an A-10 is something like 200 metres away. It's something like two or 300 yeah. metres mental. This shit came in, mate. It's like 40 to 50 metres. It was the greatest thing I've ever not watched near behind a wall ever. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that video? It's of the... There's um some, for some British lads. There's a, some British lads. They're in like a bit of a like a, a bit of a like a, a really shallow wadi, and then there's you can just hear that there's just been one run, and one of the lads must have put the camera on, and he's like making a joke like, "Oh, you shit yourself then," because one of them had come a bit close, and they're laughing and joking, and then the next one comes in like almost on top of their heads, and they're like, "Back, back, back!" It's mental. I mean, just watching the video, my guts were in my mouth, mate. It's like, yeah. oh, crazy. I wouldn't want to be on the end of one of those. I mean, yeah, and this is what you got like people say what they want about the enemy, but I tell you what, to keep coming after that again and again and again i mean jesus christ yeah right. mate. fucking oh well, they had the manpower must have kind of had the manpower but they, I, don't, but even, I don't know where the fuck they were getting them from but even the manpower though mate no. it's like in the track like because the thing is right this is what i say do i think that the like the taliban were worth shooting you know they were but they were the enemy and that's that's that right i'm not saying but the fact is we give a lot of props for our troops in the first world war going out of the trenches again oh they must have been so brave knowing what was good. well if we're doing that we have to give props to an enemy who was continuously coming in and getting smoked. We have to. Because the thing is, mate, when you underestimate your enemy, that's when you fucking lose. Yeah. And that's why we have. We have. That's why they changed the tactic. So that, though, those initial yeah, tours. Yeah, well, they're just losing too. Yeah, they're, they're losing too many people. I mean, by the time I got there, because I was like rubbing my hands like, <laughs> I had the gym pee, mate. I was like, right, here we go. Where's the human waves then? Time to get the kill count up. You know, I thought it was going to be like that bit on Hot Shots, you know, when he's got the little kill count in the corner of the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought it was going to be like that. Mate, I hardly ever saw the enemy. You'd be like, where the hell's that coming from? Yeah, <laughs> just And it's just yeah. IEDs, IEDs, IEDs. What was the, um, what was the, uh, in your time in, in Iraq and Afghan, what, what was the, the, your least, what's your most memorable? Were you ever, were you ever afraid? Ever oh, get? yeah. Got blown up once, mate. That was fucking terrifying. Oh, did you? Yeah. Uh, what happened? Fucking, uh, we were driving. We, we weren't even first vehicle. I was, I was about five vehicles back, I think, and we hit, we hit an IED in, in a warrior, and it was fucking just chaos. How big was the IED? Uh, big enough that it just destroyed the warrior, Fuck killed man. one of the lads. Unfortunately, he passed away. Um, knocked out, knocked out. <coughs> I think I don't know if I was knocked out. No, few of the lads were knocked out. Um, and that yeah, that kind of moment when it's all smoke and dust in there, and you can't see anything. You just swallowed all that dust and everything. That the the moment of the, being scared was putting your hands around you, because like you always get told, if you get a really bad wound, you're not going to feel it. Yeah. So that moment of like running your hands over your everything, do you know what I mean? Like that was that was scary. Um, small arm stuff, not so much. Never really bothered me because I think once you once you fight, especially you got Jimpy. Once you're getting and stuck in on Jim P, it's like, you know, you're really almost in your own little world because it's so loud next, what's going on next to your head, you kind of, you know, do you know what I mean? And But, like, the, the scary bits for me, the bits that always made me scared were um, looking for IDs. When you're going up to, when you're going into a choke point, be it, say, it could be, um, it, it could be if you were in Iraq, it could be, like, um, there was, a, like, I remember there was one place, one roundabout, it's like a big one, one of those big roundabouts out there. 
you've probably been on it if you worked out there. It was Green 19. So yeah, 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 yeah. Green 19. And um, there was like, I remember, you know, I've been out there with, a, with the ATO to, to calls out there. Lads had died on there. There was always IEDs on there. So when you're going through a point like that, and you're getting out of the back of the water, and you're going through looking for it. That's scary because you know they're going to be. The chances are they, they're probably going to be there, and you know lads have died there recently. That's <clears> scary. <throat> or if you're in Afghan, and I didn't have to do this very often in Afghanistan because when we were dismounted, I had the gym piece. So it was only if we were just all mounted up, then I'd take a rifle and do the bomber teams. Um, but sometimes, you know, you like you're looking at. You've got two big high compound walls narrow track through the middle of it <laughs> and you're like if there's an id yeah. i'm done yeah if there's a command wire id i'm t- i'm done there's nothing i can do yeah. about it Abs- absolutely nothing that's yeah. it and i think that's something really hard to get your head around is that like it doesn't matter how, like I me mean, even in a small arms contact you know it doesn't matter how good your drills are you could just get up at the wrong time and get hit that's mm. just how it is but at least you can give yourself the illusion that you're doing something about it by firing back with ieds it's just like you know, if you could be as you could be the best soldier on the planet, and you know you're you're a meter away from that where the ID is, and they they could use the command wire or, you know, when you actually find one, if you actually uncover one, it's not that scary really because you're like, oh well, I found it now. The you kind of the, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's just that, and I think that is, um, you know, I think people like if civvies would think. It's the people who have seen the most kind of shooting and stuff, who or the most who have received the most IDF or something, who are maybe the most messed up. But you know, just that not knowing what is beneath your feet and that constant "what if, what if, what if." I think it's actually a release when people start shooting. You know, that's my, my own experience of it. Oh yeah, it's a, it, it, no. it's, a, it's a release of tension, isn't it? That's yeah. not to say it's not controlled. So if yeah. been morons listening, go oh, release tension, they're rusting everything up, and it was mm. bloody, bloody Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> that uh. No, the the it's interesting how <clears throat> how your mind can all of those all of that apprehension and uh, stress and not knowing and the underlying fear if it's there and you're still able as a soldier, fucking sailor, whatever, you're still able to keep your poker face on mm. and do exactly what you were taught. And then if if a, something goes off, the contact kicks off, or it's fucking ID goes off and it's casually, you just kick straight. You able to you able yeah. to maintain composure, and 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 your mind is exactly on what needs to be done if this that and the other happens. It's amazing. It's it's a, it it's uh, from a, a mental aspect. It's sort of one of those phenomena. I think. Yeah. Well, I do. I think you see the difference in um, if you've ever been involved or witnessed an accident as a civvy. You see the difference between the military lads and the civvy lads straight away. You know, there's not that couple of minutes of <clears throat> absorption of what's gone on. Like I've seen when I, you know, I used to spend a lot of time in the states, and um, the place I stayed was right next to a junction where people would crash all the time. And um, you know, this, the, the difference between the civvies and the military lads. If I had military mates over and something happens, everyone's boom straight into action. Mm. Um, with with the civvies, it'd be like the frozen rabbit kind of moment. You know, and uh, I think that's probably one of the best things that you take away from, you know, the military is that is that being able to react to stuff. You know, because if, uh, you know, like the, the the thing is, is like, you're not, it's not like once you get out of the military, danger's gone for the rest of your life. You could be witness to a car accident. You could have someone in your family have a, you know, have a stroke or a heart attack or something. And that moment of that, and it's, it's getting that panic out of your head. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean that afterwards you're not shaking and, uh, you know, and, Feel of adrenaline, but it's it's that initial moment of all right, you know, here we go, we're going into it. And you know how to deal with adrenaline, you know how to deal with that surge of uh, of of what could cause you to panic, which is the, you know the fight or flight thing. So it's if someone comes at you in a bar, you you don't you you know you you have that choice of right, am I going to hit this person or am I going to back out? It's, but you're not what you're going to be able to make a decision rather than have that decision made for you because you've never been in those you know never mm. been in those positions. You don't like having a huge amount of adrenaline coming to your body changes your mindset, and if you don't know how to deal with that initially, it just frees you, you know. And that could be the difference between your life or someone else's life. And you know, I think that's. Uh, even if someone hasn't been in combat, 
I think that's something that veterans take away. If you've been in combat, then obviously, you know, you're going to have that to an even higher degree. Yeah, it's like, I think it's like a boxer, isn't it? You liken it to a boxer. Boxer goes and trains, he used to get him throw punches around and he recognizes the sign, then he goes into a bar and someone kicks off and he's just calm as a fucking cucumber. Yeah. Because it's just not, it's just, you know, like, yeah. normal pattern of life, you know. It's like Mike, was it Mike Tyson thing? Everyone's got a plan to get punched in the face. <laughs> yeah. You know, but the same, it's like, same if you played, play rugby or anything like that you know you're just used to con- the used to physical contact and mm. you know i think that's important even if you haven't done it for a few years you've still it's very deep down in there in you you know you know, your body knows that if you and if someone pushes shoves into you or bangs into you or whatever you you're like oh yeah i remember this like you know it's, it won't be as fast but you know it you know like i've got a lot of civvy mates never probably never found a punch in their life and they never played rugby probably never hit anyone in their life that's a bit mad, isn't it? You mm. think, you think uh, about yeah. it. For us as squaddies, to think that, because I'm not someone who really goes around starting fights and stuff, but, you know, it's from rugby and everything like that. You know, it's been a part of life, even if it's not been a regular part. But it's mad to think that a high percentage, I would say, of this country um, have never never had scrap. Mm. It's quite it's quite hard for us to get, like, get yeah. our heads around, I reckon. Yeah, crazy. It's crazy. Um, so, trying to... I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think what we were on before. What were we talking about? We've de- fucking gone. We're, t- we're talking about we're talking about Afghan the mission in Afghan uh, going yeah. off the rails. Talking off. Yeah, uh, gone. So you got out. What was I like? Getting out. Um, it's all right at first. So I left in two thousand. So you were full time. You so went I, I, went, I went full time regular uh, full time regular service. So I basically did a couple of years. I, so I did a couple of tours on a mobilization contract. So I did one mobilization contract, extended it onto a second. Can Let- you explain that for people who don't understand? I don't really it's, understand. So, okay, it. it's <laughs> like, so mobilization contract is 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 when you're TA or yeah. reservist. And the military go, we've got a manpower requirement here. Would you like to do it? You go, yeah. And it's like a, it's like a, a, a sort of mid, short, short mid-term contract. Yeah, you basically go and do a tour. And yeah, then you do go. the pre-deployment training on one side and then nine leaving months, stuff on the other side. Months, five, nine no, months. No, it's so. longer than that. I'd say it's over. It's because pre-deployment training could be six months. Can't so you're like it? a year. Like a I would year. say with leave and stuff, you pro- I think it was probably about 14 months or something. Right. But and I mean, then, I'm, I'm guessing now. And like, then I full-time reserve is basically, well, on, you are full-time serving with the military, but on paper, you're territorial army or reservist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you got like a PID in the battalion, so you have the number in the battalion and stuff. But when that things, and then to be honest, mate, a lot of the lads when we were doing this ended up staying on with the battalions because the battalions at the time had so many vacancies yeah. that it was really easy for Still lads do. to stay on. Still do. So I left after my um, second tour, but then when I heard the battalion was going to Afghanistan, then I was like, right, I'm getting in on that. So I went back. Um, then when the tour finished, I went to Recce Platoon. Um, and I thought, oh, I'm quite happy with this because, yeah, so I was I was happy in Recce and um, the great bunch of lads. I love the support company lads. And um, then the boss said I could go. On, he basically a boss was a legend, so he was like, any lad um, that was all the lads from Afghan. He was like, right, pick a course. I'll send up one, whatever course you want to go on. So I went and did the PTI course, um, as you can tell, because my essence. <laughs> oh, yes. and, <laughs> so I went and did PTI. Nah, if you have true PTI, mate, you'd rock up in that stupid yeah. bloody vest, Pest wouldn't vest. you? Wearing <laughs> area. So um, I don't fit me anymore. <laughs> so um, when I did that course, mate, loved it. Um, and then when I came back, got squared away, got put into the garrison gym, hmm. and I had a right good time. There were a really good bunch of boys. Where, which garrison? Uh, in uh, Tidworth. Okay. So I had a really good time down there. And we just have a laugh, and you just, we're just doing fizz, 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 fizz monster at the time. Um, and I loved it, and I wanted to stay. So time came to renew my FTRS contract. So I was like, yeah, I really love it in the gym. I want to stay there. The QMSI wanted me to stay in there because I became kind of his, like his number two guy. Um, and I just wanted to stay there. I was, I was Lance Jack. I was quite happy staying in Lance Jack for the rest of my life. wasn't bothered about going up the rank. I, I'd gone, you know, I'd come in and done the tours and stuff because I wanted the experience. I wanted to enjoy this experience of being a PTI. And then after a few years, that we just leave. And they're like, no, if you stay on, you're going to Brecon, and we're going to put you in one of the company. You're going back to one of the rifle companies, section commander. I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. I'm like, well, we want you to stay, but we want you to go Brecon. I'm like, yeah, okay, but I don't want to do that. And the QMSI wants me to stay here. Can I just stay in the gym? No, you can't do that. So I was like, fuck, I don't really want to leave the boys. But then there was one day that sealed it for me. Which was, I'd spend loads of time, like, because I used to, I, I, did, I paid to do my own civvy quals as well. So I had, like, extra, you know, I was trying to get as many skills as possible. And um, 
I spent loads of time working on like, so if, you know, if there was a ski team or battalion ski team, I'd, you know, make training plans like specific to them for what they were going to do. It was put like a lot of effort into it. I wasn't just going like having everyone turn up and go, right, steady state run, you know, put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> and um, went into show with this Sergeant Major. Um, the Sergeant Major was massive. He was a massive fat one. He was, he always wanted, always wanted squaring away on his PFA, which is there's a load of bollocks as well. Cause you're in mean, Lance Jack, you can't say no to him, but you know, it's wrong. It's, and I just think, like, once someone's done that, you just you, how can you ever have respect yeah, for that yeah, person yeah, in the rank? Yeah, yeah. You know, fat fuck. Anyway, um, he was, and I was showing him this plan that I'd spent loads of, I'd been, you know, staying back after when, after I'd been cut away to work on this plan. And he's looking at something on his screen. So I put my hand on the desk to lean over and look, and he fucking screamed at me like I was a piece of shit. And I was just like, this is mental. I've spent hours working on this. And he's talking to me like I'm a piece of shit because I put my hand on his desk. So, because, you know, before that, I'd been stood at ease, you know, like, but anyway, I'm walking out and the RCMO catches me through the window and he shouts out, he's like, hey, Johnny, you're going to come and do this, Pete, work stay on I'm like, no, I'm all right, thanks, sir. <laughs> and that was it. From that moment, I just thought, like, it's, it's, it, was an, it was a hard decision because I didn't want to leave the boys. Um, and it's made it easier for me now that a lot of them have left, that it's like that kind of like that wanting to go, because ne- it was never about the battalion. It was always about the boys, you know. I don't want to slag the battalion off, but the truth of the matter is I've never had one phone call or anything like that to see if I'm doing all right, if I've got a job, if anything like that. That's fine. They don't want to do that. They don't need to do that. They 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 didn't sign a piece of paper to say that they do that. Um, so that's fine. But that just makes it very easy for me to know that it was never the battalion that was my home. It was the fact that I was there with my brothers. You know? um, so wherever they are, you know, be that Civvy Street or the battalion, then I'm happy in either one of those. Um, you know that being said obviously there's times when I did miss it but what happened when I got out was I started working in a gym as, as a personal trainer and there was a, a rugby team there professional rugby team at the gym and I just slotted in with those guys and it was like just being back with the boys so I didn't really have any problems at all to begin with um, because I still had the, I had the tribe you know I had the boys and we'd go out a lot we'd work out a lot we'd just get into fucking mischief with each other <laughs> Um, and it was just, exa- you know, rugby lads are squaddies, aren't they, basically? But they throw a ball around instead of rounds, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there wasn't, like, that w- That made the transition at first really easy. Then one day the gym closed, um, lost, you know, couldn't, had nowhere to train my clients or anything, got offered a job working on the ships. Again, got to work with squaddies. Maritime security. Yeah, doing the maritime. Got to work with squaddies, great lads. Um, money was decent. So again not really kind of not really struggling at that point because i had the the lads and stuff and then what happened was as the company started undercutting each other the teams were sri lankan like sri lankan guys and don't get me wrong they were lovely blokes but all of a sudden i was spending months away on my own and never someone that i could talk to never someone i could relate to didn't really have occasionally you can do emails and stuff back home but all of a sudden i lost my connection to the boys and it's only now with hindsight i look back and i can see that was the moment and it was it was more than that too because what happened then was it was also that um you know there's there's some other there's some other things I'm, I'm a big believer that ptsd really manifests itself when everything's going all right you can manage it you know so well some people can manage it depends on the severity but if it's the only thing you've got to deal with it's it's all right but then when all of a sudden your wages go from you know down to 20% of what they were then you've got money worries. So now you've got two things that you're dealing with. You can't keep a relationship because you're away all the time and you don't know what your schedule is. You've got no one to talk to. You're alone. You're cut off. Once you start getting three, four, five factors on the table, that's when the other stuff starts to kind of mm, I agree. come for you then. And then I look at it now and I can literally see it like a line on a paper where that is where I started to struggle at that point then. Um, and then I think, to be honest, mate, it was a case... It was a qua- ugh, quase? It was a case of classic squaddy bloke, you know, macho. I'd actually done a great job of just compartmentalizing and sticking stuff away. And then once it got out, I wasn't going back in. Um, So I don't think that it was ever like, oh, I had no issue. It's just like the issue had just been screwed up while I was in Afghan. The issue had been screwed up, stuck down deep inside me, and it just hadn't been allowed to see the light of day. Because whenever it did come up, I'd just be like, boom, boom, boom good drink you know the old school method of (laughs) dealing with your problems of just oh if you feel down just 
get smashed. Mm. But then you feel start feeling worse, so you have to get more smashed and more smashed and more smashed. And then before you realize it, you're getting smashed every day and you think, when was the last time I wasn't smashed? And you're thinking, like, this is months and months and months of being smashed every day and this is no longer, this is no longer normal, you know, if it ever was. Mm. Um, so, yeah, went downhill pretty quickly, I reckon. Um, got a couple of years a bit blurry, 2015 and 2016. And then... Like I say, mate, like, I can't even, it's hard for me to put an exact date on it now because it's, I think it's partly one of those things you don't want to remember it. So your brain's not like actively giving you dates and stuff. I'm like, oh, this is when you started to feel shit. But, you know, I just, I, I ended up at the point where I didn't want to be any, I didn't want to be around anymore. Just didn't want to be. Um, but I never lost sight of the fact that even though I not might not want to be around, I was never stupid enough to think that it would be like, um, you know, my family would be just crack on if I was gone. You know, it would probably, it wouldn't just, it would be the end of my problems and it would be the beginning of everybody else's, you know? Mm. So that's what kind of kept me around. Um, and, um, yeah, it was just... Empathy. Yeah, it was, well, it's empathy, mate. But the thing is, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, really, because one of the main reasons that I wanted to take myself out of the game was that uh, I just felt like... I felt like I was just, you know, weak. I was just, I was just like a weak, pathetic piece of shit. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So it was like, it wasn't like I want to get myself out because I want to stop seeing things that I'm thinking about. And, and as much as that was, you know, causing me to lose sleep and stuff like that, it wasn't like, oh, I want to, you know, flick the switch so I'm not, you know, I'm not seeing this stuff. It was everyone would be better off without me if I wasn't around. And I think that maybe this is not like, because there's no one size fits all when it comes to depression, PTSD, suicide or anything like that. But when I've, I've seen some videos of lads who have done like goodbye videos, basically like that. Fucking hell. Yeah. And what kind of came across to me was that, thing is about soldiers, mate, is soldiers, especially infantry soldiers, you know, you're willing to sacrifice your life, right? You're willing to lay down your life for the good of others. And I think that that is something that's being missed in the conversation about suicide and veterans is that people automatically think oh it does he, it's because he can't deal with the memories of seeing his mate die or something now that may be the case in some people but i do think that there's also this thing of you know the the, the squaddy mentality of i'm taking one for the team if i die because i'm dragging my wife down i'm dragging my kids down you know i'm i'm a I'm a burden. I'm no longer used to anyone. It's better off if they go without me, and you know, and I, I basically take the, you know, take take one for the team. And having seen some like of these videos and notes, and having thought that way myself, I think that's something that needs to be addressed in people. Is that, you know, if people feel they're a burden, there's a chance that they might feel that the best thing for everyone, which obviously it's not, but they feel that the right, the best thing to do is to take myself out. Yeah, I've not. I, I've. Yeah, I. I it's. Um... It's just not it's different things for different people, isn't it? I exactly. Think, um, I uh, like for for me it was um, uh, I didn't I couldn't see a way of stopping the pain. Mm. So and how would you get rid of it? How, yeah. how, how can I? How could I? I couldn't see a way of getting out of the. <coughs> excuse me. Couldn't see a way I got out of the position I was in. Yeah. How do I get out of it? How do I... Uh, uh, there was the question of why, you know, I should be able to do it myself and not have to rely on other people. But then I came... I did come to the realisation that you can't solve everything on your own, you know. You need to get help from people. But it was... It was... Uh, the two or three times that... that consideration, should we say. It was... I, I can't... How do I but, stop it? But it's a knock on, isn't it? Because I think for me, it was like, it began with how do I stop thinking about, there was two things. There was the dealing with loss is one thing. Dealing with loss, dealing with things you saw. And then there was the... So I never had that. Like, I've never had that. So that was part of it. But it wasn't I know the biggest part. Do, but it, was, yeah, it wasn't the do, biggest part of me. The biggest part of me was the the feeling of my best days are behind me kind of thing. And that that was like part of it. And I was like... And I, I basically, the reason I started doing, you know, certain things was because I was looking for a way of matching. It was like, it was a, it was a double thing. It was what part of it was matching the intensity that I used to feel. And the other part was numbing my feelings to, towards, towards stuff. 
And then that led then full circle into now I'm a burden to other people because I've spent all my money and I can't get, you know, I can't, you know, I, I can't, you know, keep a roof over my head and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, do you know what, yeah. um, do you know what, a uh, couple of years ago I discovered, I, I, I yeah, I, what, sorry, go on, one of those things is, like, yeah, I, 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 want, I want to be back there and want, and want, and want to be part of that, you're generally rush, get mm-hmm. in there, yeah. being part of something fucking pure yeah. and getting, getting amongst it, as you put it, fireworks nightmare. Mm. Two years, I remember it two years ago. I sat there. I, I was at fireworks night. I was at a bench. It was, it was three years ago. Well, maybe longer than that. And uh, it is amazing when you when I, at the time I realised how similar the sound of fireworks going off mm. is to a fucking battle going on. hundred yeah. percent. And I sat there. There was people with me, but I wasn't. They were like mm. next to me. The right side. I, I sat there. I closed my eyes, and I put myself and I imagined I was back Did in the era, mate. I fucking closed my eyes for that entire fireworks session. Brilliant. It was about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Honestly, it didn't make me happy. It didn't he make me sad. Just it just, it was like, um, it was fulfilling. Yeah. It was like, a, it was like re- remembering a fond memory. Mate, the last two years, I've gone to, um, they have a great fireworks display in um, where some of my mates live in, in, um, in uh, Orange County. And the last two years, I've just stood on, and I'm, a lot of it, like, the same as you, mate, I just close my eyes, and it's just, boom, 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 yeah. boom, and, oh, God, it gives me a boner. Hey, you don't know um, wrong, we're lucky. Like, yeah. I, I hate to think what it's like for people who got fucking blown up, and, you know, and, and maybe don't deal with that. Yeah, I mean, but, but here's what I was going to say, is like, because I know it's coming there, it's just something that I can embrace. Now, what does sometimes stick my heart through my mouth is for a couple of days either side of the 4th of July, every now and again, even maybe just 3 o'clock in the afternoon, someone will set off a banger and I'll just be walking down the street on the way to the gym. 4th of July? Are you spending... Yeah, in, in America. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, yeah I, I, I try and go there every uh, like, summer on, on an extended vacation. Um, and yeah, I'll just be walking down the street and then there'll just be the bang and it'll echo down the street. And because it's not expected, that will send me... like Because that'll just send... Because your adrenaline doesn't like even though i go like hey calm down come on it's not a thing my adrenaline's already (laughs) gone and that's it like and i heard something that like if you have a big shock like that it can take almost literally a couple of days for that entire effect of that adrenaline dump to get out of your system you know it messes you up Hmm. um i I know i've started (laughs) i've started to do stuff like now i've stopped jumping out on people and like you know when you jump out on people scare people stop doing that people people now because i realized how much you can mess people up like as in terms of like the levels of like adrenaline in your system when it comes to your work and things um but yeah like it's so that's totally different but when i know it's coming it's something that i can impress unlike yeah you put it really well mate it's like a it's just like a nice little fond memory i'm really looking forward to the days when we have virtual reality to the level of being able to go back if you said to me right i got a virtual reality headset you go back to a contact 100 <laughs> percent. get me in there yeah put me like under. ready player one or something like that you got that bodysuit on have you seen the film yeah i think i'll probably be too old for the bodysuit by the time it comes out mate i'd like <laughs> i like something that's just like i don't know maybe some implant that goes up your up your backside <laughs> and uh yeah stimulates you up there but no i like i i think that'll be a thing mate I think virtual reality for vegetables... So it already is in America. They have this headset on, right? So they have this headset that they give you. One of my mates has been through this. And you like drive along... It's like you're looking in like you're in a Humvee and you're driving along the streets and then the they, the uh, therapist or whatever has like a panel they can press they can play it. AK sounds, RPGs. Really? Yeah, stuff like that. And it's, So it's not like... You know, it's not like you and me looking at each other now. Or is it? Could we be living in a virtual reality <laughs> simulation? This is another, that's another topic. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, <laughs> but it's like, it's so for lads that were blown up in Humvees. Because, I mean, you know, they're talking numbers of Americans that must get blown up in injured and stuff in Humvees off the, ch- off the yeah. charts. I mean, they had over 4,000 dead in Iraq. You know? Did they? Yeah, over 4,000, yeah. Right, right. I mean, like, and then probably what you probably triple that for life changing injuries. Mm. Um, but yeah, so they have this this Humvee <coughs> simulation, and they they play the call to prayers on there. They play the AK, so, oh, so they can read. I love the call to prayers. Yes, yeah, so, when, when you when that goes through, yeah, you just feel like you're in Jason Bourne movie, oh don't you? Oh my god, I love it. I love it. I I uh, it's two things I put on relax <laughs> on the on spot. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I put on call to prayer. Man, it's not. This isn't a beard in video. Is it? <laughs> no, I'm fucking telling you, mate. I'll stick it on. I'll, I'll find a, find a video on YouTube. <laughs> I'll find it the song on video on YouTube not what website are you looking of, at um, of uh, Call of Prayer stick that on and I, like I'm talking background music while I'm working 
if I'm on my own in the house, then this is a fucking shit fair of life. <laughs> Call the prayer of you on Arab, um, Arab Islamic singing. Um, with nothing else, just like complete, uh, what do you call it, acapella or whatever. whatever. See, no, I just music. associate that music now with uh, war porn. You know, like, um, you know, war, like the war, war footage. Porn. Yeah, you know, war footage, like war porn. You know, you go on Instagram and uh, you see like, oh, Syrian, like Syrian army guy gets shot in the head by his uh, I can't watch those anymore. See, I, I, I do and I don't. Like, I don't, I, I will, I don't watch the, any, any basically butchering where it's someone hasn't got a fight. But if it's like people scrapping, I can watch the scrapping stuff. But it's just like, I, I just believe in fair play, mate. And like the idea of, you know, I think one good thing we have as British soldiers is that we don't kill prisoners and stuff. I think that's an important thing, personally. I know mm. some people disagree. But to be honest, most mostly what I found is that people who disagree tend to be people who have never actually done any scrapping. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, I just think that I think that we are better than that. And I think once someone's out of the fight, then why do we need to? Yeah. I do. I did like. Um, I do. I, I do like how rigid we were, and I was. And I assume that we still are as a British military, as a military. Probably more so, if anything. It was uh, regarding um, collateral damage, and I mean human collateral damage, yeah. and and uh, structural. Uh, we just, we've got so fucking care, even on the on the oh six tour, so fucking careful yeah. about smashing shit up with no need from from a field full of crops mm -hmm. to a fucking building to you know um well obviously the human component was a massive thing you know if, if we need a time under the building we would be super careful about how we engaged that building you know you certainly wouldn't hit it with a with a um a law or a fucking javelin mm -hmm. or like that but you brass it up yeah if you mm -hmm. saw the enemy well yeah. what what i um I want to mean brass. I mean brass. Yeah. Shoot. So I don't aim know. shot. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know if you. I, <laughs> fucking hell. Aim, oh yeah, aim, was it aim shot as a train shot? Um, all right. What you might not be aware of, maybe you are, is that all contact reports and stuff are on WikiLeaks. Do you know that? No. Right. Everyone, put down your phones. Go and look on WikiLeaks. So, so it's for UK. I, I have. I have found. <laughs> I have found a contact report where I got blown up. Oh really? I found a contact report where I got um got bad guy, um and it's um. It's funny because it's like these these moments are some of the biggest moments in your life, and you find the contact report, and it's just two lines, of te just two lines of text. Yeah. But you know what's below that is about three paragraphs about avoiding collateral damage. So like, so like one of my mates got shot. He got shot through the neck. I'm laughing because he was all right, but um, he's just all he gets is like oh one w one ISAF WIA. That's his little bit, and then underneath there's like three paragraphs about how we avoided civilian yeah. uh, avoided civilians. And people don't know that. People think we're fucking cowboys, mate. Yeah. Now, are there moments where people have been cowboys? I'm sure there 100%, are. 100%. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, the, it go, it's going to happen. But generally, we're fucking really good at not being... 99.9% of the time. And, yeah. and, and our enemy, by the way, on the other hand, is walking into fucking churches and cafes or wherever, just blowing themselves apart. So it is, it's night and day when you compare rules of engagement. And it does it go too far? Yes, it does. Because there's definitely times where it's like... There's a Taliban guy with a bit of carpet, and you know he's got a fucking RPG in there, and he's moving to another fighting position, and you, you can't, you know, can't. Like I think when you were there, you could have engaged him with that. By the time 2010 and stuff rolled around, the courageous restraint thing, you couldn't have engaged that person. I people I wouldn't have, like yeah. an example. I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. um, so an, an example being, uh, there was, um, uh, I was in Kajaki, <clears throat> like a few weeks before the the fucking incident, obviously the, the mm -hmm. film incident, and. Um, there was a we were on that we were on normally the Ford the 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 fucking OP. Um and I spotted a uh a, a, a guy up compound, which is a known Taliban compound. And he had something in his hand. And in that area was a more uh was it no it wasn't the the recallless rifle. Yeah. And uh he went out of sight and I said I think I said, I've just fucking, I can't remember the terminology I used, but it was, I basically said, I've just I've seen someone, I think he might have had a, a recall his rifle round in his hand, carrying it around to do a shot. They only, they'd only do one or two shots for this fucking thing, mm. like beast or weapon. And, um, but at the same time, I wasn't sure if it was a bottle of Zam Zam. Remember Zam Zam? Mm. Like, a a Afghan fan. Yeah. Um, and they, they. It's just bad for your teeth, you should yeah, take them out anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they wanted to drop, they said, which one was it? Let's drop the compound. And they wanted me to commit to an answer. Oh, they wanted to blow they up the whole compound. And when I say they, the people, I was, yeah, because there was yeah. no one in that area. It was right, like, okay, fucking ticket. Because he'd come okay. out there with right. ammo. 
you know, ammunition. Mm. And I, I wasn't sure which, you know, mm-hmm. um, which was. Uh, so I wasn't, and I, n- yeah. no, no, no. I mean, there's a second thing, and there's another thing I've, I've spun up before where I was, I was told to shoot a guy, and I wasn't, sh- I, I wasn't 100% sure the guy, well, the guy, it was a dicker, mm-hmm. it was a dicker. And, um, I ain't fucking shooting. I ain't fucking I mean, there's it. definitely been a lot of people in Iraq and Afghanistan who were making a phone call who got fucking smacked for being dickers. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Well, it, have you listened to the Ben um, Griffin podcast? Mm. Oh, have I listened to that one? No, not another podcast, man. I've got too many. Mate, Ben Griffin. People so ben, start making so, podcasts. No, no. So Ben Griffin, right, he's ex Hereford. Right. Two par in Hereford. And um, he's now a a prolific member of Veterans of Peace. Nice. Um, he did a massive speech. Uh, no, not massive speech. He did a, he was part of a debate in, in Oxford um, and his talk was about how, you know, British British troops are completely brainwashed. They talk to kill people. A load of fucking bollocks, right? There's stuff in that speech There's a lot of bollocks. I got on the podcast we had a discussion about it one of the discussions mm-hmm. with the dickers. You know, it's like there's, there's a time and a place to shoot them. You know, it's, it's I mean, that is. Not every they're, time. They're being an MFC. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Um, how do we get to that? I've listened to that. He's also, awesome, though. He's a fucking awesome dude. Well, you, would you say you're pacifist? No. Uh, define, just give me the definition. What's the definition of pacifist? Don't like war. Let's see. Let's say the pacifist that you don't like war. No. Don't believe in war. No, you can't. How? What? How would you defend no, yourself? Then? I'm the same, mate. No, I'd be the same. I, I, I'd rather we didn't have to have it, but I just think it's. I, I think it's, it's part not possible. Of the, though. I think it's part of the human condition, mate. Exactly, hundred percent. It's not possible. Right. We have to have confidence. It only it's takes. In it, we got what? What is it like? Six, six, seven billion people on the planet now. Only takes twenty thousand people to cause all trouble for everybody else. Mate, you could. You, give, have, to, you, have, you have to. You have to be willing to 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 smack smack people down. You Unfortunately, could, I'm sorry. I just. No, no. What no, I was going to say is, it's just. I'm against how it's done in some cases, and I'm against why it's done. But in principle, I'm I'm fully on board with the use of violence and the use of force. I just think that um, I think I'd just rather a bit of honesty, mate. Like if it's going to be used for just lining pockets and stuff like that, I just like it's like it's like when you're fucking dating someone, mate. If someone wants to have somebody on the side or whatever, like just say yeah, it's an open relationship or whatever. <laughs> you just put the rules out there. So if it's like hey, it's like if they say you know if it's a Hey, look, we're going to have this fucking war and there's a bunch of people there going to die. But if we do, your petrol is going to be 50p cheaper. You know, give people that fucking option. <laughs> but, mate, that's basically what it boils down to. Was that Iraq? Was that Iraq? <laughs> mate, no. Here's the thing about Iraq as well, right, while we're on the subject. You know, like, if you used Would to... Would you work, go to war if it's what, 50p cheaper? For me? Would you go... Don't, yeah, have, a car, don't have a car, mate. <laughs> fucking Uber. <laughs> I, I, want, I want a planet, mate. But, right, so you're from the South, right? You're from South Wales. Yeah. You're right. I'm from North Wales, right? I'm sure we've both got miners in the family, right? No. Oh, are you? No, my, kind of my father's Scottish kind of, and mother's Irish. What kind of Welsh guy are you? Okay. Right. <laughs> All right, most Welsh, real Welsh people have got miners in the family, right? Yeah. And they used to get free bags of coal for the rest of their life. Yeah. Where's did, my free oil? Did they? Yeah. Yeah, used to, yeah I'm sure they used to. Oil, right. Yeah, well, I, I, reckon I, should, I reckon I should get Mate, got oil heating now. It's bloody expensive. I wouldn't mind a free bottle of oil. But this, this comes back to why were we there, though. This, so I, I'm getting more of the... I'm, fuck's sake, I'm getting more onto the, the, the opinion that Iraq and Afghanistan is compl- a complete waste of time. I used to say, until last couple of months, well, literally the last couple of months I've been saying it, it's like, okay, and I've, for the last few years, said it on different interviews and stuff, you know, because one of the questions that fucking journalists and stuff love to ask is, do you think we were there, it was right being there, or do you think it was worth going? Do you, blah, 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 blah. And my answer used to be, look, even if when, when I went there, okay, I don't believe in the the, the grander scheme of things that we, we should have the, the reasons we were told we were going were right. But if I went on, for example, a six seven month tour, and even in that whole tour, I only positively we or I or the unit only posit hypothetically only positively impacted one village for a couple of weeks. We went in there. We kicked the Taliban out, you know, we brought, we gave them, we paid the elders to come in and speak to us, or fucking gave them whatever, we helped them with some irrigation, blah, blah, fucking blah. Just two weeks. Well, that's a positive impact. That's something they wouldn't have had anyway, right? Yeah, but maybe they get all get beheaded at the end of it. <laughs> this is the thing. You know, that's one of the things. The other thing is that point of reference, what's good for them. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm going for my, my oh, okay, point right, of reference. So now I'm thinking, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> I think I think I'm dealing with that revelation well, though. Right? I think it wasn't worth it. You know, we um, only had twelve beers since we started. You know, <laughs> no, yeah, we, but it's a, it, that's here's the thing. Here's the problem with that that statement, though, is that 
people died, people got life changing injuries, physical and mental. Um, it, I'm, I'm, if I am going to align myself with that statement, I'm not sure if I am. I've just literally said it out loud there. I'm not, it doesn't mean it's all in vain. I don't know. It's, it's, no, I mean, look, but, but the thing is, mate, it's, it's an individual answer, but it's also a shifting answer. Because what you're like, as we grow as human beings, what my answer is now might not be what my answer is in five years' time, might not be in 10 years' time. Good and, point. and like, People, and, and I know people with life changing injuries who would never, they wouldn't, thought that, yeah, they were life changing injuries, but though you ask those lads, they wouldn't change the world like for how it is. <laughs> but then there's, there's others who probably every day think, God, I wish I could go back and have my fucking legs back and this was all for nothing. It changes every day. There's been points in my life where I've, I've been so angry about the whole thing. But then there's been there's other parts where I just think like, if I hadn't gone through, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation now, and wouldn't know you. I wouldn't be, I w- I wouldn't be. I think now appreciative of life as I am. Like I fucking you know really enjoy life now, and the reason I enjoy like I see a lot of people as we all do sleepwalking their way through life, um, and having had the lows. It's most people, mate. Most, most people, people, yeah. People so don't like, even realize it. Yeah, and I I feel like okay, did I, I had a couple of fucking years that were really bad, you know, bad years in in a lot of ways. But even those years are fucking good parts. Um, you know, it's, they, they had good parts too. So it's not like it, they were like total write-offs. But now, off the back of those really low days, I think I have really high days. I mean, I still have low days now and again. And my low day is probably lower than the low, like the, the you know, the, the society's baseline. My low days are probably lower than, you know, the average. But my days are so, like my good days, and my, mate, my average days are so, like my fucking morning today started off by, I just thought, you know, well, I'm going to go for a walk for a bit, and then I'm, you know, going to be at reading and stuff like that. Because I've got this built life, built this life for myself now, where I have a lot of control over it, and I can do, you know, like we're talking about Fourth of July. I spent the last two summers in America traveling because I know that one day I'm going to be dead, and I know when you're dead, you're dead. And so I'm making the most of what I've got now. If you haven't witnessed death, if you haven't been around it, you, you know, you, you just don't know. You don't know any better. And it's only really when people start getting into their 50s and some of their mates from school start to have heart attacks or whatever that they start to think, oh, fuck, this, this, this is a fine, you know, this, is, this, is, this does end. Well, you're already in your 50s then. Like, you know, one good thing about being a squaddy is, as tragic as it is, is you learn that lesson, you learn that lesson early. You might learn that lesson at 18 that some people are learning at 50. You've got fucking 30 years advantage over people about living your day and actually live in your life now some people don't take you know some people don't use that you know i think there's definitely this there's this misconception in society they're all just because you're a fucking squaddy you go on to be a high charge you know high charged individual who kicks down doors every day you know um metaphorically speaking but that's not the truth some people get out the army and they sit on their ass for the rest of their life and they don't do anything we need to acknowledge that you know not all squaddies are trying you know getting out there and making the most of it which i think is really sad you know um but you know that's individual responsibility but um no i think like i always try and think of it as like you know lads gave up their lads gave up their lives or girls gave up their lives and others gave up you know some limbs or other injuries but they they did do them doing that is a gift to everybody else because they've literally given us the gift of lads what you've got whenever i see one of the lads on my instagram who like there's a you know, so many lads out there who are missing legs, missing arms, whatever, who are doing amazing, incredible things. And you're thinking like, i got no reason to complain about nothing. It's inspiring. You know, it's a gift. It's a daily gift, you know, and I think people need to make most of it. Mate, you need to write that shit down and put it in the book. It's just, it's just sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> is it in the book, is it's it? Sitting next, yeah, is it? Right. We gotta wrap it up, mate. Oh, I fucking oh. agree with everything you said. That was right. an awesome monologue. Um, <laughs> right. Tell me the book, Brothers in Arms. Yeah, a book's called Brothers in Arms. Um, details our tour in Afghanistan, summer of 2009 to beginning of 2010. Um, and then what I've written in the end of it as well is the stuff that came after, which we kind of touched on here. Um, and the reason I put that in there wasn't for like self-indulgent boo-hoo, give me a pat on the back. It was I wanted to show how I fucked things up because then what's at the back of the book is how I picked things back up. Um, like I said, I'm really happy with how my life is now. I was really grateful for how it's going. Oh, well, you're um, flying, mate. You're flying. And from what yeah. I, you know, from the, from what I see, no, fucking hell, you got a you got a massive following mm. for the right reasons. You don't get your tits out. You're not shaking your ass, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously, beat the eye. A massive following. You're enjoying life. You're mm. successful. Um, 
You're obviously an awesome individual, otherwise you wouldn't be on this fucking podcast. Exactly, brother. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm in good company on here, man. <laughs> but no, like that's that's the point about the book, mate. I just want what we just talking about there, man. That's exactly it. It's just like um hopefully the aim of the book is that of um yeah, it's it's great to more I like, I want to immortalise all the boys, not just the boys who passed away, but um but also I just want if hopefully there'll be a couple of squaddies out there who are well, I mean, I wish they weren't in that position, but if they're having a hard time, that they read it, realise that someone else has had a hard time too, and hopefully get something out of it, they'll push them in the right direction, man. 100%. Well, if, yeah. mate, in all honesty, people, a lot of the stuff you said today, mate, they'll, they'll get something from that as well, listen to this. Honest, honest so, to God. Mate. Even if it's just one person listening to this. Exactly, mate. That's, the, that's the thing. Is that. That's what happens, mate. We're one brick at a time, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, exactly. Um, right, what's your website? Website is um, so I got podcast um, veteran state of mind. Oh yeah, yeah. that's vsom podcast v s o m podcast dot com, uh, and social media at grj books. That's same on everything. Mostly active on uh, Instagram. So at grj books. Golf promo with Juliet books. One word. Uh, I'll do that book as a giveaway. Yep, brother. Arms May sixteenth. If you could buy it, then I will send you your ass pictures. <laughs> They're just dick pics for me. <laughs> oh, um, you get the premium I mean, content. <laughs> <laughs> mate, fucking, that is it. Cheers, brother. I, mate, I really enjoyed that. Me too. Thanks, man. Cool.